Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just means you've got some dirt there in the rod that needs to be cleaned out. Oh. Yeah, that, that won't take a repairman long. Okay. They just got to take it apart, and there's just something okay. coming up. So, all right. So we, at least we, we won't worry about that. Yeah. We'll just we'll let that one go. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, all right, so we can assume, since they're called London trios, that he wrote them when he was living in London. London, right. So towards the end of his life, wasn't it? Wasn't he in London at the end of his life? How was he in the best of the London sentence? this? <coughs> I don't know, well, you know specifically who were, what these were written for. They're fairly lighthearted, so it could have just been house music, or maybe there was something he was putting together. But they're happy, more like a serenade, right? Uh, lighthearted music. Um, and can be played in many combinations, two flutes and cello, so all these are played in many things. The bassoon has got a kind of a difficult role. You're our rhythmic motor in our bass line, but in some ways also a complemental. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I probably would have it be a little bit less. So even though it makes it a little bit harder for you, you're going to serve the function of a cello sometimes in a quartet where it's not always, it doesn't want to predominate and take over. Mm -hmm. You're going to give us some good fundamental changes in terms of harmonies, but rhythmically, you're the pulse. Can we just start out with the, the, the soon part of its own? Excellent. So we got that nice bounce. So you'll just be a little bit under them. Okay? Great. Let's start again from the beginning. And let me ask one question. In, in this style, do we play long eight notes? In, yeah, a little lifted, because the classical style is on the way to Romanticism. It's getting a little bit longer than Baroque, but we don't play So, can we just have the oboe and flute? Wow, you've got a funky version there. You're in Russian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, today's video. All right. Wow. You, you we relearned it because we don't know what it said. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm very impressed. Yeah. Uh, will you just play the? Really the yeah. <laughs> if you can, you just play the first couple of measures for us. Sounds now I'm hearing bom bom, but it's bom bom. Yes, right. Your emphasis is on the right syllable in that case. Yeah. It's like calling someone Karen. It's Karen if you're saying a name. You know, we we have to think about the the lilt we want. And in classical style, what are dominant beats? One, primus, and then after that is three. Right. So the piece it basically ends up in a big two in a swing. So we don't want to accent that eighth note, otherwise you've kicked an offbeat, and that's more pop, jazz. That won't, ha that won't happen, yeah, but not for a while. <laughs> yeah, right. Bum, bum. So actually, will you play your eighth notes for us? We want your eighth note to dovetail into that. Will you just play your eighth note pickup, and then you'll, you won't play the next note? Actually, play your first two notes, but don't sustain the C, and then she begins. Bravo. That's the difference. And then they make sense. Together. From the beginning, uh, two T. Tonality is not democratic. It's highly bigoted. And it favors certain key pitches, and, and in terms of rhythm, we certainly favor other notes. Some notes you abuse, you just move through them. You don't care about them at all. The da yerapa, da yerapa, right? 
Let's do it again from the beginning. Just the oboe and flute on that phrase. And there, when you're in your going in your third measure, is it the downbeat of that that matters or the next downbeat? I think it's oh. Second one. So in this piece, it's not that it's just there's a primus of one and three. It's every other measure that's strong. So it's a huge two, where of a two measure pattern, the second and the fourth are being accented. This is what drives Europeans crazy about <laughs> Americans and our phrasing. You know, they grow up hearing this in a different way, and Americans, we like to, we, we read the page, you know? But you can always tell, like you can tell, and this is gonna sound maybe a little bigoted, but you know, a lot of Europeans, when they swing something, it doesn't quite work, you know, if they try and play jazz, right? But we, they don't know, but it's not in their vernacular, right? But, you know, if you grew up in Vienna, you, you're used to hearing these pieces phrased a certain way. So we have to adopt not what's, remembering that the information on the page only gives us duration of note, rhythm, and uh, maybe a little bit of phrasing. But just like when you read a language, if you actually read English the way it's spelled, you would sound crazy, you know? Thorog for thorough. We don't speak as it's written. We speak as we have, as uh, as we pronounce it when when we're in speaking verbally. Not it's not. And you're looking at the musical language from the way it's notated. It's highly incomplete. And the way we learn the right inflection is by listening, listening to a great Mozart pianist, or better yet, listening to really good sopranos who sing Mozart well. Okay. So every other measure. Let's start from the beginning. Two T. So it doesn't need to be a big accent. That's the thing to realize, is that once you've set up your inflection, if I'm speaking to you right now, you know that the next word was going to be important. I didn't have to do anything. I could say that the next word was important. If you overemphasize it, it's not, it's not necessary. It's self-evident. And that the classical style is about elegance and balance, and therefore that's why it's so often asked in auditions, because you have to have so much control. Okay. Where in minor, right? Am I wrong? Is that right? 
that's going to be more dramatic. <coughs> so that's why you want to save when you start your second sequence. Mm -hmm. You're going to save room to build into that A minor. Yeah. Can we start the oboe sequence with the soon there? So whatever measure that is. <coughs> Same spot there when the oboe starts. Two for you yeah. guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Thank <laughs> you. 
in some ways, you're the most, you have to be the most uh, chameleon-like. Because you're very soloistic. And then you come, whenever you have the yum, bum, 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 any that kind of that repeated note, yeah. then you just go back into this rhythmic motor. Mm -hmm. But then you're going to make sure consciously you'll shift. And that helps the audience realize, OK, I focus on these two. Yeah. And then we'll, let's do it again from the beginning. That's great. You're doing a great job. And that's actually very challenging. So good control. <laughs>
answer him on the next measure. Yeah. Can we do your pickup and, and the third to the third measure? Yeah. <laughs> Pick it up. 
up. Let's do the measure with your 60s. <laughs>
is serious, you know, you're back in church, you're very Lutheran. So at this moment, you have to be a little more, a little meaty. So where's a good place to start? Mr. Ogleman, who's always picking the good places. Where's a good place? Somewhere in there. For that one that you were just talking about? To get to into that bar. Okay. Great. Wait, that was one? Yeah. That's why I would have the eight notes be light in the pen. Pick up before the Uh, 
reigning dramatic soprano. And she talks about, you know, if you're stingy, they're stingy. You have to give to the audience. You have to be sharing. You have to be energetic. And that's the thing that it takes uh, in any kind of performance. And in, in competitions, it takes the, the courage to do that when we're being evaluated. That to still go out and say, this isn't a competition. I'm here to communicate and to talk to this audience. Even though some of them are sitting there writing notes. It, and then that takes a bit of courage. Right? To actually switch the situation around and not see yourself as the passive person who's being evaluated, but the active person who is saying, this is how we play, and this is what we think of the piece. And I think one of the most important things to do is just sitting together and discussing the piece. You know, string quartets, really serious ones, they really, really rehearse. You know, woodland players, we run through it a couple of times, and okay, we're ready. They really pick it apart. How do we do it this way? You know, if we, we if we phrase it this way, how's our articulation? They really discuss everything in detail, and through that, come to their interpretation. So when they play, they sound unified. But it's often because of the time they've spent working together as a group, and really analyzing, and the conversation about, you might say, well, I think we should do it this way, and you might say, well, I think we should do it another. The discussion of that is very healthy. Because then you come to a group decision as to how it should be done. And sometimes it can be the people disagreeing, but it's about finding the agreement in how we want to interpret something that starts to define you as a group. And I think that's the thing <clears throat> that we all desire the most, is for a group to sound unified and whole. And so the re rehearsal process of really getting into everything, really analyzing the piece, thinking about the stylis stylistic decisions. Uh, obviously, listening to other versions when you're young is helpful. However, you also want to see that you don't let yourself just imitate, but start to define your own values so that you have your own voice. But the energy you have on stage is the most important thing of really giving to the people in the audience. Because if they sense that you love them, they'll love you. And sometimes, as a performer, we can withhold thinking that we, we want their applause, so I, I hope you like it. But you have to realize we have to applaud them. We have to give to them. And if you ever were, uh, you know, when we, when we see those kinds of performers, and you don't see as much of them anymore, but when someone like Leonard Bernstein walked out on stage, he loved his audience. He loved, he wanted to kiss everybody in the whole audience. It took him forever to get on stage, <laughs> you know? And, and Leontine Price, she loved her audience. She loved the applause, but she loved her audience back. So you have to think about that, is, is to, to give. And, and particularly in a situation where, um, where we're in competitions. But I noticed so much more today, your sense of freedom and energy was way up. And finding that when you're, when you're in performance and is the key thing. And I felt that you all really showed you were so much freer. And then finding the way to do that in these kinds of situations is really the trick for any kind of success for all of us. And we all feel the same way uh, in these kinds of situations, so I can totally relate to it. Are there any questions that you have for me? Anything you want to ask, or you just want to go, yes? Um, what's your opinion about like standing or sitting? Good question. Um, I really, you know, um, m most everybody, well, everyone sat yesterday. No. No? no? We stood. You stood. You were the only group. Right. You stood. Um, I think it's fine if you like standing. I mean, when you guys stood, it didn't bother me. I didn't think like, oh, this doesn't seem right. Um, I think it's it's going to be hard for some groups. I mean, obviously, string quartets sit because the poor cello. You know, how are they going to do that? But as a, as a quintet, I mean, I think if everyone felt comfortable doing it, that's fine. Um, I think it should be about where you all feel the most comfortable. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. What did you all feel about it? Why, why did you guys decide to stand? It gives us more freedom to like move and express more, so that's why we did it. Yeah, I mean, as you can see, I didn't even remember because it didn't <laughs> seem like you did anything that didn't feel natural. But I think that's good. How did you? I mean, would you guys ever want to stand as a quintet, or does that of interest to you, or no? No, I mean, I have done it in the past, but I don't know how I feel. I mean, it's not, it's not good or bad. I don't think it's a group. Right, how people feel. Probably, 
hardest for the bassoonist, right? I mean, do you feel comfortable standing? Yeah, I do. Yeah, you could. Quintets, you usually see people seated, is what I could say. But if you if you makes you play better, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, it's it's really the 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 your ability, the product of what you're putting out, is the most important thing. Any other questions? Rice this morning had the bassoonist sitting, but they were on like a podium. Their chair was on a podium. And they were sitting, and everyone else was standing. I saw that. Yeah. Like the bassoonist wow. was in the back, and they were. So it was like they were like six inches like closer to being proportional to everyone wow. else standing. That is a little odd, I don't, yeah. yeah. That yeah. seems odd, but I didn't see it, so shouldn't say anything. <laughs> Good things you're thinking about, like how do you connect with the audience? Well, yeah. Question. Since uh, string groups can obviously move a lot more and express spatially, and when we can, yes. how do we overcome that? Well, you know, there you go. That's a, actually a really interesting conversation. You know, we have a whole generation of soloists who spend a fair amount of time expressing themselves on their face, but not so much through their instrument. You shouldn't have to see somebody to understand their phrasing. And if you look at people like the great artists of the past, styles have changed, I think, since we are in a video era, where era, or error maybe, uh, where people are used to seeing you and fairly up close. So when I was growing up, if you went to Carnegie Hall, I could see Rampal, but I couldn't see his face very well unless I had an extremely expensive ticket. But now people are used to a real visceral connection. And you will see a lot of very, very famous, in particular, <laughs> keyboard players uh, and string players these days, where it's all on their face. But you don't necessarily hear it. And I don't agree with that. I think that's a cheap way out. If you watch Martha Argerich, who I believe, in my opinion, is probably the greatest pianist who is still alive, and her work in the 60s and 70s and 80s, I encourage all of you to listen. There is none of that. But when she finishes, an audience is just, they're up on their feet. They're so energized. You, you shouldn't have to resolve, resort to that. It should be what's in your sound. Because we're not actors. Now, I think that if someone sits there and they look bored, that's not acceptable either. But uh, some of the histrionics, I think, have gone too far. And I think it can be a, um, it sometimes is an easy way out for people as opposed to really, really playing well. If you watch Torovitz, he never moved a muscle. But the audience was crazy at the end. He had that energy. He had a charisma. That's worth developing as opposed to some of the theatrics. However, there's some people who disagree with me. And that's fine. It's a big world. And there are many ways to play your instruments. And there's many ways to make music. And it's, everyone should do what they believe in. You know, it should be, we're all free to do that. I just wouldn't buy a ticket to the other ones that I've ever seen. <laughs> Not any other questions? All right. Well, you guys are great. And you all sounded great today. Congratulations. Don't be disheartened in any way. Uh, you never know how these things play out. When you get older in your life, you'll see the order of things, which when I was your age, I couldn't see. But something because you meet somebody here or there and they remember you or someone remembers your playing, even if you didn't get moved on, they may say, oh, you know, I like that bassoonist, or I, I really like the way she phrased in the, in the Rossini and the Bricialdi, and they might say, yeah, 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 I remember them. And they'll choose you for a summer festival or for a chamber music group, and you'll meet somebody. And you never know how things work out. And, uh, you know, we, we can sometimes be a little bit, you know, confused by the success that we may not get right now. But we have no idea of knowing of how that will play out in the future. So it's always about your positivism. Um, and, and, and when I went to an audition, if I didn't win, I always made sure I went up to the people and who won or got moved on and congratulated them. Because I would want them to do the same for me. And realizing that, you know, another time, my time will come. And to celebrate for them and realize that, you know, I, I learned everything I could from the audition and tried to be a better musician. And that's the most important thing. And uh, I really appreciate all your work today. And you all sounded terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.